Good morning, everyone. Uh, I was just saying we're waiting a couple minutes for people to be joining. As you join, you'll see it. there is a quick poll um, on your screen. We're quite interested in what brought you here today. So if you could take a second to fill it out, that would be most appreciated. Welcome everyone. Um, just letting everyone have a couple of minutes to join this morning. Um, thank you for attending. As you come in to the webinar, you'll see that there is a, uh, a poll on your screen or hopefully there is. Uh, if you could take a second to fill it out, we're interested in what brought you here today. And then we're going to get started at about eight 32 to just let some final uh, people come in. So just give us a moment. Okay, um, we have had a couple of people join. So I'm just gonna say there should be a poll in front of you as you're joining the webinar. Oh, and thank you for everyone who answered. We have quite a spread of different levels of interest. Um, so we're quite excited to hopefully get some of your questions answered today during this webinar. Um, and really appreciate everyone's attendance. We're gonna get started um, and by way of brief introduction, my name is Faith Horner. I am the program director of the Wildlife Crimes Program here at C4ADS. Um, I'm joined by Ellen Tyre, an analyst on our team, as well as Max Kearns, a senior analyst with a focus on data science, both of whom had really integral roles in the development of the dashboard as well as its underlying data. As we get started, I'm gonna just go over a couple of housekeeping items. So you'll see at the bottom of your screen, there is a chat box as well as a question and answer or Q&A box. We're gonna save about 15 minutes at the end of the presentation to go over questions. But if you have any questions that come up throughout, please post them in the Q&A box and we'll keep track of them in there to make sure they're answered at the end as time allows. But if you have any comments or suggestions, feel free to put them in the chat. So just to repeat that, Q&A box for any questions you'd like us to address and then the chat box for any general comments or um, thoughts on the presentation. Okay, so uh, 
Before I hand it over to Ellen and Max, I just quickly wanted to go over why we created this dashboard in the first place. So some of you may know that the C4ADS has a wildlife seizure database, and that database is the underlying data that feeds into the dashboard. We built that database and have since maintained it um, in 2016. But the data actually traced back to 2012, with the most robust part of the data being 2013 to present. So that's why the dashboard covers those, those last nine years. Ellen and Max are going to be expanding a bit on the specifics of the database throughout the presentation, so I won't get into too many details now. But what I will say is that we used and continue to use the C4ADS wildlife seizure database to guide our own internal analysis, as well as to produce public reports and contribute to news articles on the illicit wildlife trafficking topic. And through these experiences, we've found that seizure data can provide insight into highly trafficked areas, obfuscation methods, as well as enforcement success rates in different jurisdictions. But we wanna be transparent before we get into using the data that seizure data is an imperfect proxy for the illicit wildlife trade. While it's the best quantitative proxy available in our opinion, it can be skewed by a number of things, including reporting bias, law enforcement activity, and most of all, it only shows the small amount of illicit wildlife trade that is caught, leaving out successful routes, methods, and actors. That's why we want to caveat that seizure data is best used to supplement or contextualize qualitative research that's coming out of organizations that are on the ground. So with that, for us, seizure data has always had its own intrinsic value, but it's become of particular interest to many stakeholders in the tracing of the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and we saw an increase in requests for data access from law enforcement, journalists, and private stakeholders over the last two to three years because of this. Those requests combined with the value that we see in making this data publicly accessible uh, drove us to create the dashboard. And with the assistance of the C4EDS data and technology team, we've put it together over the last 10 months. So we're very excited to share it with you today. And I just wanna go over two key items that we hope you take away from this webinar. So first and foremost, why you're all here, how to actually use and leverage the dashboard. Secondly, we will also be doing a live analysis um, that we actually will have you guys be choosing for us. So we hope that you're able to leave this session with an understanding of some specific trends from that analysis. I'll hand it over to Ellen and Max to discuss the data and dashboard in more detail. But as I said, there's gonna be time at the end to answer questions. So feel free to populate that Q&A box throughout the presentation. Uh, over to you, Ellen. All right, thank you, Faith. So before we get to the C4ADS wildlife seizure dashboard, we first have to take a step back and consider how this endeavor began. Specifically, before we can discuss the dashboard, it's necessary to examine our database. The C4ADS wildlife seizure database was created in order to record wildlife seizure data from a variety of publicly available resources, including news media, customs reports, and other digital sources, even social media, in 15 languages from all over the world. The purpose of this database was to gain better insight into illicit wildlife trafficking. Through the comprehensive collection and analysis of seizure data, it is possible to trace the development of trends, assess the relative significance of different typologies, and develop a more holistic picture of an otherwise clandestine activity. Today, the C4ADS Wildlife Seizure Database contains information on over 5,000 seizures from 2013 to the present, spanning over 100 jurisdictions, all transportation sectors, and five key categories of frequently trafficked wildlife, elephant ivory, rhino horn, pangolin products, 
tigers, and leopards. I'll turn it over to Max now to discuss how we've made our seizure database accessible and interactive through the C4ADS Wildlife Seizure Dashboard. Thanks, Ellen. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about the dashboard from the data perspective. And while we do so, we'll navigate to the About page where you can find more information about our methodology. Uh, so on the diagram on the screen, you can see our sort of data pipeline. I'm going to be talking a little bit about the automated cleaning. Um, so we've set up a, a pipeline to feed data from our structured data holdings where analysts curate the data into the dashboard. The pipeline is set up using Amazon Web Services, so it's entirely cloud-based. Uh, it reads the data from its source location, and from there it automatically creates a backup of the data in case of emergency. From there, it conducts numerous checks on the data for accuracy. In any data collection project where humans are involved in the collection, uh, human error is inevitable. So we check the data thoroughly with code each time it's loaded into the dashboard to try to minimize these errors. From there, it loads the clean data into the dashboard's database, which is also hosted in the cloud. And then from there, the user can use the dashboard to query the data however they like and as often as, often as needed. And this pipeline rewrites the database fresh every night. So the dashboard is always uh, displaying the most up-to-date up to date data. So if, anal if an analyst like Ellen finds a seizure in the open source today, it will be reflected in the, in the dashboard tomorrow. And additionally, if analysts are presented with updated information about an existing seizure, those changes will also be reflected. So this is a fairly sophisticated tool, which we hired software engineers to create. But for most of the time we've been using this data, we've only been using open source free software. So a database such as this can be created without a large investment outside of the labor hours for collection. And the process for curating this database has been adapted a number of different times. So this, this kind of data collection is difficult as the analytical questions that we want to answer change over time. So we've learned a number of different lessons over the course of creating this database, some of which have required us to do overhauls of the entire data set where we go back through the entire database to fill out information that we didn't previously structure from the sources, which may, again, may include news media, customs reports, and other digital sources. And this is possible because of the rigorous sourcing process that we, that we employ. We preserve a PDF of our source, of each source in our centralized wildlife trafficking investigative database housed in Palantir Gotham. Uh, so just in case the source URL moves or, or is taken down, we'll still have a record of that source. And now in its current form, our database is in a really great place for the kind of analysis that we do uh, because we collect and structure as much information as we can from our sources, even if we don't have a current plan to use it in our analysis, as it may become important down the line. And if you're interested in learning more about the database or our methodology, please see this about page on the dashboard, or please contact us at wildlife at c4ads.org. And with that, I will turn things back over to Ellen. All right, thanks, Max. So now that we've heard a bit about how the C4ADS Wildlife Seizure Dashboard works and the data behind it, we're going to walk through a live seizure data analysis using the dashboard. And we'd like to invite you to choose which topic we explore today. On your screen, you'll see two options of analysis that can be examined on the dashboard. And we'll give you a moment to make a choice and whichever one was selected most will be the one we explore today on the dashboard. These are two of the most common questions we get asked regarding our seizure data. And of course, whichever isn't selected today, we hope you will revisit the dashboard in the future to pursue analysis on it. And you're also welcome to reach out to us anytime for more information. All right. Oh, there's a close one. So it looks like global pangolin seizures wins this round. All right. So let's dive right in. At C4ADS, we love to talk about pangolins. If you read our report, Tipping the Scales, then you might know that we've considered pangolin seizure data in depth in the past. Pangolins, which are native to both Africa and Asia, are commonly trafficked species 
that gained significant media attention towards the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. But when I say commonly trafficked, what does that mean exactly? We're going to walk through each tab of the dashboard with you to see what we can learn about pangolin seizures and how they've changed over time between transportation sectors and across different regions and countries. I'm going to put a particular emphasis on how trends in pangolin seizures compare to that of other species in order to highlight the dashboard's utility for comparative analysis. To give you an idea of how the dashboard works, the tabs here at the top of the page designate different forms of analysis grouped by theme. We have over time, transport type, location, and the country profile page, which includes country-specific overviews of wildlife seizures. And like I said, we'll walk through each of these pages to explore the different forms of analysis that we can do to evaluate how the trends in global pangolin seizures have evolved. So let's start off with looking at this map here to see the rather global scale of wildlife seizures. This map displays country-linked seizures, which refers to a singular incident of wildlife trafficking through a country, regardless of whether it was seized in that country or not. By hovering over the countries, we can determine how many seizures have been linked to that particular country. China, for example, has been linked to 1,238 seizures while Zambia has been linked to 52 seizures. Since we're interested in pangolins in particular, we can use the filter here on the left side of the page to customize our results. The filter will automatically adjust graphic and narrative analysis throughout the dashboard to answer your questions about wildlife seizure trends. So filtering to pangolin, we can see on the map that seizures of live and dead pangolins, as well as pangolin scales, are largely concentrated in two areas, Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia and China. This is a promising start to the analysis. We've already been able to identify two hotspots for the seizure of illicit pangolin products. Let's take this one step further and look at the overtime page. Here on the overtime page, we have three graphics and two auto-populating sentences that can be used to understand the temporal trends in wildlife seizure data. And as you can see, the filter that I selected on the homepage remained as we moved onto this new page. Looking at this first graph, we can see that seizures of pangolin products were on the rise in the years leading up to the pandemic and then dropped in 2021. Let's look at how this compares to ivory and rhino horn, for example. As you can see here, ivory and rhino horn seizures steeply declined after uh, in 2020. And when considering this analysis for the webinar, I found that pangolin seizures not declining in 2020 was rather odd. So I looked into the underlying data and discovered that this example raises a very important distinction that we wanna be clear about. Seizure counts or anywhere the label pangolin is used encompasses seizures of live and dead pangolins as well as pangolin parts and pangolin scales. The only place this differs is when we look at the weights of product seized, in which case we're only looking at pangolin scale seizures. So in digging further into the underlying data, I found that between 2019 and 2020, seizures of pangolin scales dropped by about 20%, but seizures of live and dead pangolins increased by about 22%, which makes sense. We see this sort of leveling off in the graph because between those years, and it, it, it may seem a bit of a surprise to those working in counter wildlife trafficking, but of course we don't wanna to focus too much on the nuance, but we're also welcome to discuss this if you have any further questions or whenever you see something that might seem counterintuitive to your own knowledge about the state of the wildlife trade. We're happy to dig into those details in our database that didn't necessarily make it into the dashboard. So to jump back into our analysis, if you're really interested in pangolin scale seizures, like I mentioned, we can toggle here to the weight of seizures graph. And you can really see that sharp decline in pangolin scale seizure weight here in the pink line in 2020. And while this line chart shows the similar trends occurring across the weight of wildlife seized over time, if we scroll down here to the next chart, we can see better the proportion of seizures and weight seized that pangolin scales constitute. Looking here for the counts, pangolin seizures displayed in pink are not quite as prominent as ivory seizures displayed in blue. But toggling over to the weight of seizures, 
it's clear that the pangolin scale seizures represent a higher proportion of the illicit wildlife product weight seized. And filtering down to just pangolin again, it's clear um, from the sentence below that 30.2% of all pangolin seizures in the past nine years were quantities larger than 100 kilograms. Scrolling down to our final chart on this page, we can see that the average pangolin scale seizure over the last nine years was 597 kilograms per seizure, which is much higher than the average seizure size for ivory, which was 93 kilograms, and rhino horn, which was 18 kilograms. This demonstrates that pangolin products are often trafficked in bulk. Now, before we transition to the transport type page to see if those bulk shipments rely more heavily on certain transportation sectors, let's quickly review what trends we've been able to identify here on the overtime page. First, the weight of pangolin scale seizures dropped off significantly after 2019. Second, while pangolin seizures don't make up the majority of seizures across our five key wildlife categories by count, pangolin scale seizures do constitute the majority of the weight seized of wildlife shipments worldwide. And finally, as a result, the average weight of a pangolin seizure is much higher than either that of rhino horn or ivory. And on that note, I'll hand it over to Faith to take our analysis a step further on the transport type page. Thanks, Ellen. Um, so keeping in mind what Ellen was talking about, we're going to use the transport type page to identify which parts of the transportation industry are most relevant to transporting pangolin products. While you're able to filter to specific transport types on each page of the dashboard, this page is particularly useful for analyzing trends between or comparing the different transportation types. So let's get started again by filtering down to pangolins. Looking at this first chart on the left, you see that seizures on land in green account for the majority of pangolin seizures. And looking at that teal line, you see that maritime seizures don't account for very many. But then looking over on the right, which is the total weight seized by transportation sector, maritime seizures account for the majority, 61% of the weight of pangolin scales seized. So rather significant. Um, if we keep scrolling down, we've really built on the fact that on the first page, we know that pangolin is often transited in large quantity shipments, but now we know that these large shipments are most commonly occurring in the maritime sector. Here we have four temporal bar charts, one for each transportation type. Looking quickly, we can see they generally all follow the same trend that Ellen pointed out on the first page, an increase in seizures in the years preceding the pandemic, and then a quick drop following the pandemic. I want you all to pay particular attention to this graph in the upper left corner for air seizures. So, you can see there is that increase in seizures leading up to 2020 in the air transit sector for pangolin products. If we toggle over to the weight of seizures and look at that same air graph, um, air transportation graph in the upper left, we can see that this trend is not the same that we saw in the previous tab. While the previous tab showed an increase in seizures, this tab shows a decrease in the weight of pangolins seized in the air transportation industry. If we want to make comparing these graphs easier, there is an ability to download them. So up here in the upper right corner, in most of the graphs on the dashboard, we have a download option. So we're going to do that here. This makes the graphs quickly accessible and easy to just input into any research project that you're doing and use them yourselves. So now that we've brought it up, we're gonna toggle back to that number of seizures 
um, graphic and look at them side by side. So this really shows that increase in count and decrease in the weights of pangolin scales seized in the air transit sector. Okay, we're going to scroll down the page a bit farther to the last graphic we're going to talk about here. In the bottom left in this, I don't know, periwinkle color, we can say, we have air seizures. So we can see here that in the air transportation sector for pangolin seizures, they don't account for many of the seizures or much of the weight seized. This compares to land in green, which accounts for a lot of the seizures and a good amount of the weight seized. But nothing really compares to maritime on the right, which doesn't have too many seizures, but accounts for the vast majority of the weight seized, that 61% we had talked about at the top. So knowing this, the air transit industry may not be as relevant for interventions for pangolin trafficking as the maritime industry, just because of the quantity that is moving through the maritime industry compared to the air transit sector. So we went through a lot, so I wanna quickly summarize kind of the key analytical takeaways from this page before handing it over to Max. Through this page, we're able to better understand which transportation sectors are most relevant to the pangolin scale trade and really highlight that seizure count alone does not tell the whole story. But by looking at where the bulk of pangolin scales were being seized and transferred, we really shine a light on the role of the maritime industry in pangolin, illicit pangolin trafficking. I'm gonna hand it over to Max to go through the last two pages for this analysis. Thanks, Faith. Uh, so now that we've discussed how pangolin seizures have changed over time and through different transportation, transportation sectors, let's consider which jurisdictions are most relevant to the pangolin trade. Once again, you can filter to regions or specific countries across each page, but this location page really highlights the differences between jurisdictions of interest. This first graph sheds light on how much of the trade is intercontinental compared to intracontinental. As you can say that there is, as you can see, there is a lot of intra-Asian trafficking as well as some intra-African tra African trafficking and Africa to Asia trafficking. Since we discussed the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on pangolin seizures, let's first filter to 2018 to 2019 and take note of, uh, sorry, uh, take note of the size of the intercontinental uh, trafficking bar. And then we'll compare that uh, to seizures in 2020 to 2021 to see how that, how that changed. And we can see a dramatic change. Intercontinental trafficking makes up a much smaller fraction of trafficking since the COVID-19 pandemic began, likely attributed to the limitation of the global transportation economy, as well as increased border closings. Uh, so now let's take a look into some specific countries. Um, and let's go back to the homepage quickly to see which countries may be of interest in terms of pangolin trafficking. So looking here, Nigeria and China stand out to me as significant in terms of pangolins. So let's filter to those two and then go back to the locations tab and have a look. So these two graphs here attempt to show how countries fall into the supply chain and how effective they are at preventing shipments of, in this case, pangolin products within their country. The graph on the left shows where in the supply chain various countries fall. So where information is available, our data records whether each country involved is an origin, transit, or destination location for each shipment. For instance, we can see that China is mainly a destination country. And just as a note that when I say origin, I don't necessarily mean the poaching location. I'm referring to where that shipment originated. The graph on the right, meanwhile, tries to show the efficacy of each country's enforcement. 
It does this by using the information we record on the route of each shipment and classifying the countries involved as having seized or missed a seizure opportunity. If a shipment was seized before arrival in a country, then it will be classified as no opportunity. For instance, let's think about the case of a hypothetical shipment that originated in Nigeria, was destined for China, but transited through Vietnam where it was seized. For the purposes of this graph, Nigeria would have missed a seizure, Vietnam would have seized it, and China would have had no opportunity. We also com combine these numbers into a score called the Country Enforcement Index, which we'll discuss on the next page. So this is not a perfect measure, so we need to have some caveats in mind while we look at this graph, but it can still show us valuable information. For instance, in China's case, we can see that it seizes the vast majority of shipments that enter into China. But by looking at the graph on the left, we know that China is a majority destination country for pangolin shipments. In the case of a destination country, shipments that pass into that country will either be seized and reported on, or there'll be no public reporting, or will not be seized and not reflected here. But this tells us that the majority of shipments bound for China are not stopped by the preceding countries on the route. In the case of Nigeria, we can see that for pangolins, it's a majority origin country on the left but that the majority of shipments are not seized by Nigerian authorities. So this doesn't necessarily mean that China is better than Nigeria at seizing products because due to the nature of reported seizures, destination countries like China will have a higher enforcement rate. Instead, it's best to compare origin countries to origin countries and destination countries to destination, to destination countries. These graphs can tell us quite a bit about where resources may be most effectively deployed in countering trafficking. Deploying resources to enforcement in Nigeria may have significant impact for reducing trafficking out of this country because we can tell that it misses a majority of trafficking that leaves through its borders. And finally, if we're interested in an overview of the trafficking activity in Nigeria or China, we can move over to the country profile page, which offers an interactive glimpse into each country's role in global wildlife trafficking. Some of this information can be found elsewhere on the dashboard, but this page is a great starting point if you're interested in a given country. Note that there's no filtering on this page so that you can get a sense of each, the role each country plays in the long term. By selecting a country, for example, Nigeria, we can view a variety of statistics and visualizations for the entire timeline of the data. On this page, we can get an overall picture of trafficking activity in a given country. We can see hotspots within the country, we can see which destinations in other countries are most likely to be involved in shipments. We can get an idea of the type of trafficking methods that most, most often occur and how well a country restricts wildlife trafficking within their borders with the, the country enforcement index. Interestingly, in the graph of reported seizures within Nigeria, we can see that reported seizures actually increased from 2019 levels since the COVID-19 pandemic began. Again, this may be due to an increase in trafficking, an increase in enforcement or an increase in reporting. But from here, we can get an idea of what may be worth further study in this country. And just to take a look at one more country, we can switch over to China, where we see the opposite trend on the bottom left uh, since the beginning of the pandemic with reported seizures going down since 2019. We also see predictably that China has a much larger volume of trafficking given its status as a major destination country. And then turning over to the country enforcement index, which reflects the information we saw on the previous page, we can also see that China's country enforcement index is very high, meaning that it interdicts most of the known trafficking instances that enter into the country. As we discussed on the last page, this is partly a result of China being a destination country, meaning that shipments that pass into China will either be seized and reported on and re reflected here, or there'll be no, republic, no public reporting or no seizure. And with that, I will turn things back over to Ellen to wrap up. All right, thank you, Max. So to summarize our findings of this analysis using the dashboard, it's evident that pangolin trafficking continues to be a significant global problem. Seized pangolin shipments have often traveled in bulk in much larger quantities than other categories of wildlife, such as ivory and rhino horn. To move such large quantities in one shipment, Trafficking networks appear to be relying on the maritime industry and are transporting pangolin products intercontinentally between Africa and Asia. Moreover, the dashboard identifies a few key origin, transit, and destination countries, such as Nigeria and China, that have a clear role in the pangolin supply chain. 
We hope that the knowledge derived from this analysis can be used to raise awareness about the scope of the problem, to direct resources to where they may have the greatest impact, and to help private sector stakeholders identify where or in what way they may be able to help have an impact in combating illicit wildlife trafficking. Finally, if you're interested in learning more about the C4ADS Wildlife Seizure Dashboard, you can visit the About page located here to read more about our methodology and seizure data. You can also find our contact information here on this page to request more information about the dashboard and its underlying seizure data at wildlife.c4ads.org. So not only does the C4ADS Wildlife Seizure Dashboard empower users to independently navigate and conduct advanced analysis on high quality wildlife seizure data, but as we've noted, it's routinely updated. And as a result, you can check back on the dashboard frequently to track evolving trends. Ultimately, the C4ADS Wildlife Seizure Dashboard was designed to offer insight into global wildlife seizures across transportation sectors by placing data-driven analysis directly into the hands of counter wildlife trafficking stakeholders. So if you're a journalist working on an article that could benefit from having a quantitative context, we hope the dashboard could be a useful resource for your work. And if you're interested in the underlying data of the dashboard, or in generating graphics beyond what the dashboard currently has to offer, we invite you to reach out to us directly. For supporters of counter wildlife trafficking efforts, the dashboard seizure data analysis can highlight which areas are most critical for intervention, whether that be geographic areas, transportation sectors, or wildlife categories. We're happy to speak more to you as well about the trends present in the dashboard's data. We also recognize that some of you watching today may maintain wildlife seizure databases of your own. In the near future, C4ADS will be developing a private platform that will be able to host select partner seizure data. This platform will facilitate data analysis while maintaining security and privacy of the data for its users. If that is something that might be of interest to you, please reach out. We're always glad to discuss general best practices for database management and any data on transnational crime more broadly. Lastly, if you're involved in counter wildlife trafficking efforts and are interested in speaking to C4ADS about the types of trainings or investigative support we can offer, please feel free to contact us anytime. I'll wrap up by saying that in providing reliable, up-to-date evidence upon which counter wildlife trafficking stakeholders can base their decisions, we hope that the C4ADS Wildlife Seizure Dashboard will serve to reduce the space in which illicit networks can operate and we encourage you to be part of this endeavor by making use of the dashboard to explore trends in wildlife seizure data. Thank you. Thanks, Alan and Max, um, for your overview of the dashboard and the analysis. We're gonna transition over to the Q&A period for the last bit of the webinar. I see there are a couple of questions already in the Q&A section. If you haven't submitted a question, um, please feel free to jump in and submit one. Uh, we're gonna work our way through starting at the top. So the first question we have here is, are you aware or concerned that your data made public can be used to improve um, illegal trafficking. So basically, are, are we giving traffickers insight into what people are monitoring by doing this? That's a really quick question, a really good question that I'm gonna answer quickly. So this is something that's been brought up that we've put some thought into. We haven't actually seen um, evidence that wildlife traffickers are harnessing research like this in order to improve their own obfuscation methods and things like that. I think a lot of traffickers participating in the trade um, because they're able to profit from it are aware of the high risk areas already um, and are used to having to adapt to increase enforcement. This data set in particular doesn't get down into things like obfuscation method um, and some of those more specific details. So we're not quite concerned um, with that at this time, just because we haven't found evidence of wildlife traffickers using this data for that, um, as well as 
just a lot of the information that's in this dashboard, uh, traffickers who are already operating are likely aware of the risks of moving through these specific jurisdictions. Um, hopefully that answers your question. The second question here, I think would, uh, maybe Ellen, you can take this one. Uh, it is, you mentioned things like obfuscation method in the beginning, um, but I don't see that information in the dashboard. How can I access it? Yes, thank you for your question. So at this time, not all the types of analysis that we can do are possible in the dashboard. Things like obfuscation method, analysis by city, um, breakdown by product type even, are not in the dashboard, but we're happy to provide you with that analysis if you reach out to us at wildlife at c4ads.org. Um, and additionally, while the development of this particular dashboard is complete for the time being, we're hopeful that this is the first iteration of many. I uh, previously mentioned the private platform, but we're also looking to, in the future, expand this public dashboard. And whether that means adding new types of analysis, uh, like you mentioned with obfuscation method, or building out new data sets to include more species, even building in new capacities, like hosting written analysis or other resources here on the dashboard. Um, we're always looking to, you know, enhance our analytical abilities. So if this is something that is also of interest to you, please feel free to reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Yeah, um, we're quite interested in feedback on how this could be improved. So please reach out to us. Um, Okay, the next question is, what type of impact have you seen from using and sharing seizure data? Uh, Max, do you wanna speak to that? Sure, so <clears throat> that's a good question. Um, we were a member of the Routes Partnership, which was a partnership uh, with the aim of reducing wildlife trafficking in the air transit sector. And it was a partnership between different NGOs as well as uh, air transit stakeholders. Um, and it's really showed us the evidence uh, that the role of the air transit sector had in wildlife trafficking and how much of an impact they could have. Many private sector industries are used to basing their activities on quantitative evidence. So seizure data can be really useful when engaging those stakeholders. And we can you know, partner with these, these types of organizations to actually have a, a large impact on, on how transit or wildlife trafficking uh, is, is reduced. Thank you, Max. I think the next question is also something you can likely speak to best. Um, so can you provide more information about your data collection process? Sure. So uh, the process overall, um, we use a collection platform that uses Boolean search terms in 15 languages. So basically it just Googles all these search terms every day in 15 different languages and flags the results to us. Um, and from there, we take those results and we have consultants that, that look through them and find the relevant sources um, and do some cleaning. And then it passes through a number of checks. So we review it by our own analysts. Um, and then we review again, another round. Um, and then we compare it to quarterly summer reports by other organizations so that we can be sure that we're, we're in line with what other people are finding as well. And then periodically, we go through the entire data set to just do basically another just periodic check of every data set or every uh, record in there just to be sure that we have, you know, the, the best database that we can have. Thanks, Max. Um, there's another question about how do you check the reliability of the data sources that you use, especially since a lot is coming from news media. Um, so building off of what Max was just saying, we do a couple things. So one, which he mentioned is we collect throughout as news articles come in, we're updating the dashboard every week and the data every week. Uh, and as we do that, we try to keep track of multiple sources of information. So if one news article is saying, you know, 30 kilograms and the other one is saying 50 kilograms, we try to continue to find additional news sources to see what is the most commonly reported amount. And then we take a note of the discrepancy within the actual, the database itself. 
since it has over 5,000 seizures in it, one like 10 kilogram seizure is not likely to really skew this data very much. But when we get into, you know, 500 kilograms or multi-ton seizures, that actually can have a significant impact on, on the quality of the data if it is inaccurate. And so for those seizures, we have a standard of collecting like two to three sources at the very least. Um, and then we often will cross compare our seizure data to other seizure data that different organizations are putting out to make sure that um, they're, they're aligned in, in their reporting. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, going down, here, let me just clear that one. Um, plans for the future and what timelines are you working towards? Um, Ellen, do you wanna talk a little bit more about the future of the dashboard in the private platform? And then I'm happy to maybe talk about the timeline portion of the question. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we mentioned a little bit in a previous question about how we envision the dashboard evolving in the future. So ideally, this is just the first iteration. We, of course, have lots more data in our database that we could potentially expand on. Um, there's always the potential to add new species. So we have our five key categories of wildlife species currently displayed on the dashboard, but it's always a potential to add new species and collect that data um, to incorporate. We could also add different types of analysis. So, you know, having over time transport type, location, country profile, perhaps in the future, we could add something like a product type analysis tab where you can break down, okay, let's look at the real breakdown of, you know, pangolin seizures. Was it a live pangolin? Was it a whole uh, dead pangolin? Was it scales, some other part of a pangolin? We can break that down a little further into analysis or even have you know, other types of written analysis for context located directly in the dashboard in the future. The private platform that we also have mentioned is something that would be similar in that it can generate these graphics and the analysis based on a set of seizure data, but the difference is that it would not be publicly available. It would come from select partner seizure data holdings. And so visually, it would appear somewhat similar uh, in terms of the types of analysis that we would curate for that particular data set based on what um, the partner is interested in analyzing. And then it would be very secure in order to ensure that uh, the, the privacy of the data is maintained. And Faith, if you wanna talk more about the timeline on either one of those, I'll hand it back to you. Yeah, so on the updating of this dashboard itself, um, I think it's minor updates, you know, as we receive feedback, we'll probably just incorporate those. So you might see some small changes, but in terms of larger updates, adding new types of analysis or new graphs, that is something that we wouldn't really expect to be happening for at least a year, um, just due to our shift of focus onto the private platform that Ellen's talking about. For the private platform, we're expecting that development to take a year to a year and a half. It's a bit more complicated um, because every partner that is joining that private platform has differently structured data. So the ontology is going to have to be mapped uniquely. And we want to have a very interactive process to make sure that that platform really gets to the core of the questions that partners want to be able to answer with their data. Uh, so because of that, for kind of the first couple of organizations that we've identified, we're on track for like a year, a year and a half, and then we'll assess growing that capacity. But uh, because we do want to grow it beyond just two to three organizations, we're quite interested in who would be uh, interested in adding their data to the private platform now in order to be able to start building in that capability as we're, we're kind of coding the back end of everything. Um, so please reach out to us if that's something you're interested in the long run. It just might be a bit of a, a, a year and a year and a half before that conversation really starts picking up. So I wanna be transparent on that. But thank you so much for your question. 
Um, we have another question. Uh, does underlying seizure database include species beyond those covered by the dashboard? Max, do you want to talk about that? Uh, maybe you might have a better insight into that. Sure. So this database itself is just these five key species. Um, we do have other data sets like Max mentioned. We've previously maintained the C4ADS AIR seizure database as part of the routes partnership, which covered more species, but only seizures in the air transit sector. Um, so if you're interested in a different species, reach out to us. We're happy to provide what we do have. But for this data set in particular, right now, it is just ivory, rhino, horn, pangolin, tigers, and leopards. Um, then maybe Max for the next one, definitely up, up your, your alley. Can you tell us about the technology used behind the dashboard, the front end language and libraries and what kind of database it is? Sure, so um, the front end is coded in React. Um, and some of the visualizations are created with D3 and AmCharts libraries. Uh, and then the database is, it's just a standard Postgres database um, and it's all hosted on AWS. Um, so the database is hosted in RDS um, and yeah, good question. Yeah, excellent question. Um, our next question is, what are the 15 languages you conduct searches in be interested to know if Africa or Asia are better represented. Um, listing all of them off the top of my head, uh, I don't have them. I can certainly email you them if, if you reach out at the wildlife at c4ads.org. The uh, kind of software that we use that automates a lot of the collection does kind of your classic romance languages as well as things like Arabic and a couple other languages. We know that um, there are some languages that that platform doesn't have capability in that are very relevant, like languages spoken in India, as well as Vietnamese. So we have an additional process that we manually screen using Boolean search terms of those languages in addition to using the platform. But overall, um, I think, you know, French is covered, Swahili is covered, Arabic's covered, and obviously English, but um, local African languages are not as well represented as languages spoken across Asia. And the main driving factor behind that is because a lot of news releases on in Sub-Saharan Africa are done in English, so English catches most of them. Uh, but if you are aware of certain countries that are mostly reporting in a local language or a different language other than the four I listed, um, would be very interested in adding that to our collection process. So uh, please reach out. Um, and then there's a question, are there any plans to broaden the scope of the species being monitored in the illicit wildlife trade? Uh, I think that the answer is yes <laughs> to that one. We would love to expand uh, to collect more species. It's the, I think the big hindrance is something Max brought up. Doing the collection isn't all that complicated. Um, it just takes a lot of labor hours and time. And so we haven't, um, haven't had the capacity to really do that. We did add tiger and leopard more recently than we had the original three species. And at one point we also collected helmeted hornbill seizures, which I forgot to mention for whomever asked previously about other, um, I think it was Kyle about other seizures that we collect. We do have a separate helmeted hornbill seizure database that we stopped updating about a year and a half ago, just because they're, um, so critically endangered that there isn't actually many seizures of them anymore. But if you are have a particular interest in helmeted hornbill, we're happy to provide that the data we do have to you. Um, but yeah, hopefully one day we'll broaden the scope. If anyone has species that they think would be most valuable to have databases on, perhaps species that 
uh, other organizations or you're not aware of a database being around for them or just are really relevant to your work, um, drop it in the chat or send us an email. Uh, we're always trying to assess how we could broaden the database. Okay. The next question is, um, how many seizure information is nice to have and how much information is truly relevant, I think is likely what, um, I think is the core of this question. Let me know if I'm interpreting it incorrectly. Oh, how much is noise and how much is truly relevant? So. Um, then it's linked to how big is the team of curators to be able to collect and curate this amount of seizure data? So uh, we have a team of two consultants. Each consultant has an analyst at C4EDS that reviews the seizures. And then we have Ellen who maintains oversight over that and um, Max controls kind of the automated cleaning process. So all in all, it is about, what is that? Six people, but it's not full-time employees. Um, so I'd say our seizure data collection for the consultants is typically around 20 hours a month of work. And then we put in another 10 to 15 hours, um, if I had to guess on it. So it's about, you know, 25% of one person to, to collect this data. Um, at this point, the information we collect in terms of what we structure, I'd say isn't uh, really fall into the noise category previously, maybe, but we've gone through so many iterations to really narrow it down to what is relevant. Um, you know, has gotten us to a point where we feel like all of the columns we collect are, are relevant to the type of analysis we wanna do. There is another kind of debate of some seizure databases only collect seizures that are like over 50 kilograms or over 500 kilograms, um, which can make collection processes easier. And then you just don't get a lot of the smaller things that are potentially less relevant to like the larger syndicate trade. Um, we've found that collecting the smaller seizures is still relevant, particularly if we want to look at industries like the air transit sector or things that are shipping through mail, because those are often in smaller quantities and just more frequent. So we do collect those, but there is a lot of value in the alternate um, argument of you only really need to collect the big things if you are looking at this global level. And then if someone's looking at a specific country, then you maybe want to collect the smaller seizures. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, let me know if it didn't. And then the last question we have here, um, feel free, we have a couple extra minutes. So um, type something in if you have another burning question, but do you compare your findings to CITES seizure data? CITES seizure data is interesting. Um, we don't, I would say right now, because it doesn't have as much of the level of details to make it easy to discern which seizure compares to which one they're reporting. Um, also, it can really be, I guess, skewed by which countries are sufficiently reporting. Um, so I guess the short answer to your question is we've found more value in comparing our findings to organizations um, who are collecting for a specific jurisdiction. So maybe an organization in Kenya has a Kenya seizure database. Let's see, because they have so much more insight into what's happening in Kenya, how that compares to what we're seeing happening in Kenya from our like 500 foot view here in the United States. So we kind of find, instead of comparing to other global data sets, comparing to country level data sets, often allows for just higher quality comparison, but um, certainly is still a valuable data set. Do 
do we have any other questions? I haven't been able to stay up with the chat, but I don't see any in there. Um, if not, I'm just going to throw in the chat our email address, wildlifeatc4ads.org. Um, so if you have any follow-up questions, reach out to us there, um, and one of us will get back to you directly. Uh, we really hope that you found this presentation valuable um, in either learning how to leverage the dashboard or learning about pangolin seizures. Um, if you have questions, uh, if you're able to leverage it and it provides you insights, we would love to hear those stories. So just reach out to us anytime. And if you're not interested in talking about seizure data or the dashboard in particular, but you just want to connect with our wildlife crimes program or any of the other programs at C4EDS, you can still reach out to us there and we'll direct you to the right person or happy to set up a conversation about the other types of work that our team does in addition to analyzing seizure data. So with that, um, thank you all so much for attending. Uh, have a good rest of your day and uh, yeah, hopefully we'll all be in touch.